Well, hello, good morning. Today we are starting with a new lesson, lesson 3, concurrent programming viewed as an abstraction. This is the first lesson about concurrency and the concepts we are learning here are very important in order to understand the next lessons about concurrent programming uh, with the language Java. So although it may seem that this lesson is a bit uh, boring, I suggest you that uh, pay attention to the concepts and try to understand all of them very, uh, uh, very deep. Okay. So to make this lesson more interesting, what I'm going to do is uh, basically to show you Firstly, the concepts I want you to know, and then we are passing to the slides that explain these concepts in a more theoretical uh, way. So, <clears throat> what we are seeing here is a first part in which we will learn how to pass from sequential programming to concurrent programming. This is the first part. In the second one, we will see the advantages and usages of concurrent programming. It is clear that from the point of view of performance, using parallel programs are much more efficient than using sequential programs. Then we will see an extremely important part of this lesson, that is the inherent problems in concurrent programming. This is the main, or these are the main concepts we will uh, deepen on the next lessons by using the Java programming language. And these problems are mainly atomic sentences. Well, this is not a problem. This is actually a concept. And the problems are that we need to maintain critical sections and mutual exclusion. And finally, we will see something about platforms for concurrent execution. Well, in the first part, we will see the difference between sequential programming and concurrent programming. And I will show you these uh, differences by uh, drawing a clear cartoon. Okay, basically, you know that in a sequential program, you have a line of flow execution, okay, of a process of, of a program P1, and this program may be composed of sentences, okay? Sentence one, sentence two, okay? Sentence three, and so on. And you may have very clear in your mind that in a program sequential like this, S1 is executed before S2. These may be read as precedes S1, is before S2 and S2 is before S3. This is clear in a sequential program because the word sequential tells you that there is a sequence of sentences S1, then S2, then S3. However, when we work with concurrent uh, programs, uh, what we are doing in a concurrent program is having not only a single process, but we have several processes, okay? So in addition to P1, we execute at the same time, for example, another, another P2, okay? And P2 executes another set of sentences. Let's say, for example, instead of using the letter S, let's use, for example, E. E1 is the first sentence, E2 is the second sentence, and E3 is the second sentence. So, in a case like this, what is the order in which the uh, sentences of P1 are executed regarding E1? I mean, the line of time is a single line, okay? So, if I execute P1 and P2 at the same time. Suppose, for example, that P1 is a person and P2 is another person, and that 
S1, S2, and S3 are tasks that these persons have to do. So if I uh, uh, give the, the charge to P1 and P2 to execute these sentences, at the end, which be the order in which these sentences S1, S2, S3, and E1, E2, E3 will be executed? Well, actually, it depends on the uh, agility okay, of each of these person. For example, if P2 is a lazy person, then probably P1 will end before P2 and the other way around. So maybe that when these two flows of execution finish, okay, perhaps, simply perhaps, may happen that firstly finished S1, then finished S2, then because it's more lazy P, uh, uh, P, P2, then P2 finished E1, okay, then finished P1 S3, okay, and then finally P2 and E2, okay, and then E3. So this me, this may be one of the possible a, a, a finishing a way of finishing the different sentences. But this actually depends on the load of work of each of these persons. Maybe, for example, that one of these uh, persons uh, is tired, not lazy, and in general depends of the current load of work of each of these processes or persons. So sometimes, sometimes the flow of execution may be this, okay? But perhaps if you execute this again, perhaps you obtain a different order of execution. So perhaps when you execute this again, S1 finish the first, okay? But then E1 finish, then P1 is faster than, uh, sorry, P2 is faster than P1 and finish E2, then is P1 who ends S2, okay, and then P2 ends E3, and finally P1 ends S3. Okay, so when we talk of a single, of a single uh, process like this, a single process, in a single process like this, we may be sure that we'll finish firstly this, then this, and then this, okay? But when we talk about processes that are parallel to processes, in this case, we cannot guarantee the order of execution. Sometimes the order of execution may be this, okay? But perhaps when you execute this again, you obtain a different order of execution. So in the end, we may have different orders of execution in parallel programs. This is shown here, where it's explained <coughs> that the idea is uh, uh, to execute uh, programs in computers, okay? And that basically in a sequential program, in each clock cycle, an instruction is fetched from memory, is decodified and executed, and then it has a particular order. For example, if this is a sequential program, P1, P2 uh, until Pn, P1 executes before P2, P2 before P3, Pn minus 1 before Pn. So if we use this symbol to represent the concept of precedes 2, okay, we have that in a sequential program, in any execution, in every execution, P1 is before P2 and P2 before P3 and so on, okay? And this behavior is always the same, even if the code includes a conditional or loop sentence. For example, if we have a, a sentence like this, we know that in any execution, the condition V will be computed before executing A, the sentence A, or, or the condition V will be computed before executing the sentence B. 
Well, <coughs> if we have a while program, we know that for any execution, firstly, we will compute the condition, then, or, or we compute the condition and we exit, or we compute the condition, we execute A, we compute the condition and we exit, or we compute the condition, we execute A, we compute the condition, if it is true, we, cal uh, we execute A, then we compute the condition, and because it is false, we exit, and so on. So the number of times that the condition is executed depends on the input. Okay, so basically, the final conclusion is that our program is deterministic. Given a program and an input data set, it can be predicted which is the next sentence to execute because the sentences are ex strictly ordered. Okay, are strictly ordered. However, in concurrent programming, this may not happen. Suppose, for example, that this first sentence is executed by one processor. This is executed by another processor, and this is executed by a different processor. Okay? <clears throat> so, well, in a, uh, uh, when we execute these three sentences by different processors, the final order in which these sentences can be executed may be different. For example, firstly, the processor one may, be execute, may execute the first sentence, then the process two executes the second one, and finally, the third processor executes the third one. But may happen that the third processor finishes before the second processor, okay? And the first processor finishes the first, or maybe different orders of execution. Okay, so, not all the sentences of a program, of a concurrent program, when different sentences are executed by different processors, okay, the, then the program is not executed sequentially. So the order is not deterministic. In a case like this, the code can be executed in six different orders. And in a case like this, we introduce a new operator, the operator parallel, to express formally that x2, uh, sorry, x equals 0 executes in parallel to y equals to 0 and executes in parallel to z equals to 0, and therefore maybe six different orders of execution. Well, <coughs> this is a particular slide that we will not have in, into account, okay, because actually we assume that a sentence is executed uh, when finished, okay, but sometimes we may uh, think, okay, we may think that if simply if we have two sentences because the sentences executes uh, overlapped, okay, and, and by different processors may be executed uh, overlapping, okay, we may conclude that may exist executions in which we may say that a, uh, neither p uh, finishes uh, before Q or Q finishes before P. Okay, but anyway, this is a, a slide <coughs> that we're going to, to skip uh, and, and to take only into account to know that maybe overlapping, okay, but in general, we are going to work with situations like this. Okay, <coughs> so how to understand well the meaning of uh, an execution like p in parallel to q? Well, to understand this correctly, the idea is that we have two real processors. You may think that processors are like persons executing things. So when you put two processors to execute something at the same time, is the same as having two persons working at the same time in the same room. Okay. <coughs> In general, we assume we assume that perhaps, okay, perhaps we may have a computer with two processors, two CPUs, two cores, okay, and in general we may have, for example, ten pro, uh, processes, okay. So if we have ten processes and only two processors, okay, well, the idea is that we are going to assume that we have ten virtual processors, okay? Perhaps there is a time uh, slicing to assign different uh, processes to each proce processor, 
Okay, but in general, if we have 10 processes executing in parallel, we will assume that we have 10 virtual persons executing each uh, process, okay, in parallel. So, to work in parallel, we don't need actually parallel processors. Simply, we need uh, to think on it, okay? We need to think that we have these parallel processors as if they uh, may be as if they be virtual processors okay so then we may say that if we have a, a process like this with these sentences p1 until pn and another process a q with sentences uh, from q1 to qm okay we interpret that the execution in parallel p and q okay in a simple in a in uh, when there is a real processor uh, alone is with time slicing okay and these are when we have these two possibilities for example we say let's say that p has two sentences and q has three sentences then these three represent the 10 different valid executions okay on a single processor i mean the sentences are interleaved okay so p in parallel with q generates an execution tree and each branch of the tree is a valid execution of p in parallel with q okay so when we execute parallel programs we should take into account that any of the executions of these types of trees is a valid one okay so we must be extremely careful in that any of them be a correct result of our program okay for example this is one of all these possible executions okay perhaps when we execute this again we obtain a different uh, order of execution okay this way we have here that the different sentences of p in parallel with uh, q uh, define a partial order and perhaps not all the merge are valid suppose for example that we have uh, three persons working okay the first person must order a stack of documents the second one has to sort another stack of documents and, and the third person must put both stacks of documents into a bookshelf then it is clear that the third person must wait for the other two persons to finish so if we execute the three at the same time we need some type of coordination in order the third person to execute after the first two persons finish okay so in this case not all merge of the execution of these persons is valid okay so in any case it is clear that the internal order of the sentences in each person in p and q must remain okay so uh, well in any execution okay in any execution if i is lower than j okay pi must be executed before pj and and the same with uh, q okay this uh, happens and in any other execution okay perhaps pi may be before uh, qj or the other way around because the internal order in the same process p or q must be maintained but between processes p and q maybe in this order or maybe in this other order okay so the order inside p and q is kept up but there is no need of any order among the sentences of p and q so <clears throat> at any time different sentences are available to be executed and one of them is randomly selected in the tree we have previously established so therefore a parallel execution is always non-deterministic 
although we will use at some point, some time, some type of coordination, okay? And then the sentences of P and Q are partially ordered. Well, with this, we have seen the semantics of interleaving, okay? And we have to think on the processors and the processes like if uh, we have as many virtual processors executing the processes as we need, okay? So please don't think if your computer has two, four, six or eight uh, actual cores, okay? Simply think in the number of processes that your own program has, okay? So basically, in general, we cannot take for granted anything about the relative speed of virtual processors or about the exact time of execution taken by any block of code and then the execution, the sentences of the different executions can be interleaved in many ways. Okay, this is what you have to take into account. To sum up, we say that P in parallel to Q stands for a concurrent execution of P and Q. Uh, P and Q are named processes, but in the jargon of Java, we will use the uh, name threads, okay? Threads, because they are executed concurrently with other processes, okay? But anyway, the code inside P and inside Q is executed sequentially, okay? If P and Q are the sentences, then the total number of valid execu executions of P in parallel to Q is calculated by using this formula, okay? Each valid execution is named trace, okay? Please keep in your mind this name. A trace is a branch of the tree, okay? A sequence of interleaved executions in the coming from the different processes. We will use a lot this concept, okay? The concept of trace. And finally, a program P in parallel to Q is correct when all its traces are correct, okay? When we introduce some type of coordination, okay? Some type of coordination. Well, now we are passing to see some advantages of a concurrent program. And uh, I think that uh, everybody knows that a concurrent program has a lot of advantages from the point of view of the performance. Here we are seeing an example in which we want to sort an array of numbers, okay? For example, in a case uh, like this, we want to sort this array of items, okay? And then we uh, start sorting, for example, in, in a case uh, like this, we uh, know that the first one is sorted, then we go to the second one, we sort the second one, we put the second one in its correct position here, then we work with the zero, then we put the zero in its correct position, shifting it to the left until it goes to the first position, then we uh, do exactly the same with the next one, with uh, which would go here between the zero and the five and so on with the next, the next, the next, the next, the next, and so on, okay? So, so this is an example of insertion sort, okay? Whose complexity you already know that it is approximate, approximately uh, n uh, to the square, okay? Perhaps divided by, uh, yes, n to the square because we have to execute two loops, one loop is i and then there is yeah, an inner loop j okay that executes from uh, uh, each of them executes n minus one and uh, this would be the code to implement the insertion sort with the two loops here the two uh, four loops and here basically what we do is to interchange these numbers okay as soon as we find that they should be shifted to the left, okay? <clears throat> this would be the implementation of the main function that fulfills the vector, displays on console, then uh, calls to the function insertion. The function insertion is this in the public class insert, okay? And finally, display the vector already sorted.
However, we could use here uh, an, a concurrent implementation following the next approach. Suppose that we have this array to be sorted, okay? And, well, suppose, let's remove this. Suppose that we have this uh, array to be sorted, okay? And uh, the length is n, okay? You know that in the insertion sort, this takes approximately n to the square to be sorted. But what would happen if we take a concurrent approach in which we divide this vector in the middle? In the middle. Then we sort this part, which would take n divided by 2 to the square. That in the end would be n to the square divided by 4. Okay? And other processor, other processor, at the same time, sort this. Okay? At the same time, sorts this. And this takes the same. n divided by 2 to the square. And this is approximately this. So, in this time, this is executed at the same time than this. So, sorting both halves takes this number, this time. Okay? And then, once that we have sorted this and this, okay, this and this, we may proceed using a merge approach a merge approach that knowing that this is sorted and this is sorted simply iterates sequentially from the beginning to the end from both halves at the same time and for example asks which is the lowest one this or this if the lowest is this then we put at the beginning of the final result Okay, and then we discard this. Then we ask again, which is lower, this or this? Maybe, for example, in this case, again, this. Well, we put this, okay, again here, and it is in its correct position. And then we ask again, which is the lower, this or this? Well, maybe this, then this goes here, and then we advance here. And this way, we may merge both halves in a single step, that is, in a step, in a, in a step whose complexity is n, okay? So, in the end, we have reduced the complexity to n plus n to the square divided by 4. Compare it with the original complexity n to the square. We have divided, basically, the complexity by 4. Okay, so <clears throat> following this approach that can be seen here in this example, basically we initialize the vector the same way, but here we insert a half. In this case, we are doing this sequentially, okay? We insert uh, the next, okay? And finally we merge. But what would happen, okay? What would happen if we execute this and this in parallel, okay? If we execute them in parallel, this is the sentences that we uh, should write in Java. I don't uh, expect that you understand it now, but simply, this is the idea, okay? This is the, the idea. If we execute this in parallel, we will achieve a higher uh, performance, okay? we will achieve a higher performance. So this would be approximately the complexity of uh, one of the executions. I say <coughs> this is approximately the complexity of the sequential case, the sequential case with two invocations and the case of the parallel. You may see here that in the case of the parallel uh, and in the case of the sequential, uh, 
here appears n to the square divided by 2, okay, whereas I have written this, I have simplified in this case, okay, I've used the big numbers, so the real complexity is this divided by 2, okay, in the case of sequential, and then the case of parallel, because this should be divided by 2, this is divided by 8, okay, so these are the real uh, complexities that we could achieve, okay. So you may see here how we obtain uh, um, a better performance when we execute this from a parallel point of view. Well, what we are seeing now, it's perhaps the most important concept that we are managing in the rest of the course. We are going to uh, work with the problem, the main type of problems that may appear when two proce processors work at the same time and they should be communicated and coordinated in some way. Well, first of all, <clears throat> let's see that in a program, okay, when we have several processors uh, working, perhaps they should work on a common or in a shared resource, okay? For example, for example, suppose that we have a global variable x, okay? And that both users should work with this global variable, okay? Perhaps a good way to communicate uh, one processor with a different processor would be by means of x. x is like a postal letter that you send okay, by, by royal post, uh, postage, okay, from one sender to a receiver, okay? This may be a way to communicate a sender with a receiver by means of a global variable accessible by both processors, okay? A different approach, mainly when the processors are in different computers and then there is no global variable in shared memory, okay, it doesn't exist the concept of shared memory because the processors are not in the same computer but they are in different computers. In a case like this, the communication should be uh, executed by, by uh, the network, okay, and then we can use the concept of message passing, okay. Message passing is simply passing some information, some piece of data through the network from a processor to a different processor. <clears throat> this is an example, let's uh, focus in this course on the concept of shared memory, okay, working in the same computer with different processors. And this, the, this case where the sender puts some information into the global variable and this value must be received by another processor, okay? Take into account that because the sender and the receiver are working at the same time, what would happen if the receiver executes the uh, asking the, the content of X before the sender puts the message, put the value into X, okay? Well, in a case like this, the receiver uh, could be take the value of x from the mailbox, okay, from the post box, before the value is put by the sender, and this cannot be allowed. So this is an example of synchronization condition. The receiver shouldn't be able to read the message until the sender has written it, okay? So we will work a lot in this course to avoid these situations. To illustrate clearly these concepts, we are going to work with an example of the tickets vending machine. Suppose, for example, a theater uh, in which uh, the tickets are sold by different, by different persons, by different processors, okay, in different ticket offices. So a customer can go to different different ticket office, okay? And these offices work in parallel, okay? Work in parallel. 
So at the same time, maybe a queue of customers here, a queue of customers here, here, and here. And uh, what's the problem that we want to avoid in this case? Well, we want to avoid to sell to, sell to two different customers the same seat in the theater. This is what we want to avoid. And let's see that this may be not uh, as easy as you may expect, okay? Well, <clears throat> here we are going to uh, illustrate the concept of atomic sentences, okay? Of atomic sentences. Suppose, let's write here, let's, uh, I, I'm showing here the code that executes each of these ticket offices, okay? So each ticket office is a process TI, TI. All the ticket offices work concurrently. All the ticket offices execute the same code, okay? And the seats states of the theater are stored into an array of booleans. Array of boolean seats. If it is true, then the seat is taken. And if the seat is false, then the seat is available. And simply, when a new customer uh, goes to a ticket office, the ticket office executes forever this process. That is, shows to the customer the untaken seats, okay? Then the customer select a seat, okay? Then the person in the ticket office sets this seat to true and finally print the ticket and gives uh, it to the customer. This code is exactly the same that executes any of the different ticket offices. But we will see here that if all ticket offices are working in parallel, they may, may lead to problems. Okay, this may, may lead to problems. For example, suppose <coughs> that we have uh, two ticket offices, the office I and the office J, okay? And uh, at the same time comes to these two ticket offices, two customers, okay? Then the two persons, uh, the, the two persons in the ticket office show the untaken seats to both customers. And suppose that now by chance, both customers select the same seat. For example, the seat number 22. Then both persons in the ticket office, okay, both uh, vendors, set the same seat to true at the same time, okay? And then both of them print the ticket. And this happened because when both customers saw the untaking seats, both of them, both customers, saw that the seat 22 was empty at the same time, and they selected this, uh, this seat. So this is an execution trace that is a branch of the tree which behaves incorrectly. This is a possible trace. This is a trace, but this is an incorrect trace that we should avoid in our parallel program. Okay? And a trace like this is useful to show that a program is incorrect. Okay? Because the seed number 22 has been assigned to two different customers. The problem here, <coughs> okay, is uh, that the, the users have seen them, uh, the, the seeds available. Perhaps we should change uh, this and we could add that after the user select the seed, we check again if the seed uh, is available. But, uh, well, this would lead to the same error because, for example, if both of them check this at the same time, check the seat 22 as I'm taking, and then both of them execute this if at the same time, okay, both of them will see that is I'm taking, and then both of them will execute this at the same time. So we have the same problem as before, okay? But well, anyway, now we have located exactly the lines in which uh, the problem appear, okay? So the problem here is that these two lines can be executed in this, in this trace, and we should avoid this. That is, the idea is that when the if is executed, the correct way should be to set this immediately to true, 
okay, to avoid that any other person, any other customer could check that this seat is to false. Okay? If these two sentences could be executed as atomic, okay, as atomic, that is, this could be translated into machine code, okay? But anyway, the idea is if we could execute these four sentences, these four sentences, load the seats A to a CPU register, test that the value of the seats A in the CPU register is uh, false, then jump to L1 if it is true, and if not, then seats A to true. If these sentences could be executed immediately, instantaneously, then the problem could disappear because because this couldn't happen this line should be executed at the same than this this is the trace with the error okay this is the trace with the error so if we could uh, guarantee that the uh, cyan that these uh, highlighted lines are executed at the same time then the problem could disappear okay so here it's important to realize that the uh, if the concept of atomic sentence that is the concept of a block of sentences uh, that is executed in a single uh, step as atomic this concept would resolve many problems of coherence and uh, in concurrency okay so <clears throat> valid interleavings would be only those which happens before or after, but never interleaved, okay? Never in the middle. So this would resolve our problem. This leads us to the concept of a critical section, okay? Because an atomic sentence is actually a, a, a machine code that is executed by the CPU. It's not a set of uh, uh, instructions. So here we create the concept of critical section. The concept of critical section is simply a block of code in a process that ought to be executed as atomic, okay? That should be executed as atomic. And when two critical sections of two different processes uh, cannot be overlapped when execute, okay? Then we say that they execute in mutual exclusion, okay? I mean, if this is a critical section in the process one and this is the critical section in the process two, okay, then we know that if this is in execution, this cannot be in execution, okay? So they are mutually exclusive, okay? They are mutually exclusive. This may be represented this way. If the critical section of I and the critical section of J are critical regions of the processes TI and TJ, then the mutual exclusion states that for any execution or completely the critical execu uh, se uh, section of I is executed before the critical section of J or the other way around. But they cannot be interleaved in any case. In any case. So, the concept of atomic sentence resolve our problem and to implement it we need to establish the concept in terms of, of critical section because the only atomic sentences that there uh, really exist are the machine code okay but we uh, create the concept of critical section and this concept leads us to the other concept of mutual exclusion Well, to finish, we have now only other three slides in which we explain uh, superficially mm, the different platforms in which we may work uh, in, a, in a single system, I mean without a distributed uh, system, okay? So in a single processor system, that is a computer with a single processor, only one core, okay, only one core, well, the only way to implement the concurrency, to simulate concurrency, because in this, if you have a single person working, you cannot 
do parallel things, you may simulate it, okay? So you can interleave the sentences of the processes. That is, you execute a first sentence of the first process, then the same person or the same CPU executes uh, another sentence of the second process and so on. So it's using the, the single line of time to do different things of different processes. It is useful to serve many users with a single computer, okay? This is a, a, an approach that was used a, a lot in, in very old computers. When a process executes uh, some operation that blocks uh, the input-output, okay? For example, waiting for an input from the user that takes a lot of time in comparison to the uh, speed of the CPU, then the idle CPU cycles can be used to execute other processes, that is, the CPU <clears throat> can execute other things while it's waiting the, the user. In this type of uh, computers, the memory is shared by all processes because it's only accessed by a single processor, okay? So communication between processors, uh, sorry, between processes is a straightforward by means of shared memory and because uh, there is a single person, a single CPU, a single uh, processor executing everything and then it has access to the different uh, memory of the different processes. But anyway, in addition, communications by means of message passing are also allowed. When we have a, a situation like this, in which we have a single computer with different CPUs or with a single CPU and different cores and uh, a single main memory, okay, in a case like this, a true parallelism can be achieved because we have different persons, different CPUs, working really in parallel, okay? The way in which a CPU can communicate with this CPU? Well, usually it's made by means of RAM, of global variables put here. So this CPU, if this CPU wants to communicate with this other one, this CPU puts something here, and then this other CPU takes it from here into its internal cache memory and works with it. But to do this, must be uh, used some type of uh, coordination or synchronization uh, step, okay? So as, uh, as appears here, the natural communication among processes is performed by means of short memory. Each processor may have its own local memory, usually faster, the cache memory inside each of them. And uh, usually, in a case like this, uh, each CPU is assigned more than one process. And it's assigned one, uh, more than one process because what happens if we have only three processors and we want to execute 10 processes? Well, we have more processes than processors and then some of them must uh, divide its available time uh, to do uh, multi-task operations, okay? This architecture has a very high performance due to the parallel execution and the low cost of communication operations. And, uh, well, uh, this is a case uh, with distributed systems. I told previously that we weren't going to talk about distributed system, but this is the only slide in which we will mention them. And here, basically, the idea is that each computer is composed by a CPU and its own RAM, CPU its own RAM, CPU its own RAM, and so on, okay? And there is a line of communication, usually by network, in which, uh, by which uh, the different computers can communicate. This architecture also allows real concurrency and each node in the work may be a single processor or a multiprocessor highly coupled. This means that this CPU could be a single processor or even could be a multiprocessor. Okay, so this could be a, a mixed system with a multiprocessor and distributed system. Okay. So communication among the processors inside the same CPU would be made by means of the shared RAM, uh, whereas the communication among uh, processes uh, ex in execution in different CPUs is performed by means of message passing through this network, okay? 
In this architecture, the communication between different uh, computers take uh, a lot of time in comparison to, uh, uh, to communication between processors in the same computer. And uh, well, we have to be very careful because uh, these communications among different computers may take so long, okay, so long, that perhaps could neutralize the performance gained due to parallel execution. So in these cases, we should try to do uh, to isolate as much as possible each computer and to uh, perform communication sentences uh, only when they are really uh, needed to allow a, a, de a decrement of performance in the parallel execution. Okay. Well. With this, we finish our study of the third lesson. I know that this is a very theoretical lesson, okay? But please, uh, you have to take uh, into account that the concepts we have learned here are really important, and we and we are going to depend on them in the next lesson lessons. And basically, all this course will be on how to develop programs to avoid incorrect traces in our programs, that is, to make coherent programs with a synchronization among processes by using Java. With this, we finish.